Let me throw out one other thing that you can help us by doing. Don't just let students be a people of the book. You be a person of the book. Like, I think one of the greatest ways we model for others the need to be people of the book is by actually being people of the book. So please pray. That's not to caveat away from, like, us praying, but also for all of us to be a people of the book. Well, today, we have kids with us in the service, which is awesome. So glad to have all of you kids with us today. It's great. About every time you see a fifth Sunday, we just, we're going to invite the kiddos in with us because we really do believe when Jesus said, let the children come to me, he didn't mean come to him across the street. He really meant that we are to be not only people that gather together as adults, but we're to have times where we're just to be as a whole family. And so this is one of these family times. So if your kids get squirrely, it's okay. Um, I get squirrely when, we, when somebody else is preaching. But it's, it's just, it's seriously, it's a wonderful thing to have every one of them here. Now, what we've been doing is we've been going through what's called the Great Commission. It's this term that was given to it many years ago. And it's, it's around this passage of scripture in Matthew 28. So if you have your Bibles, you can open it up. In fact, if you've got Bibles and you're sitting next to your kiddos, or you got your phone or your tablet, open it up so they can even see it. This is a great time for you to pull out those Bibles and to put them in front of them. But Jesus, as he's exiting now and getting ready to leave, this is about maybe a couple weeks before he leaves to go back with the Father, like we find in Acts 1. This is one of the last statements that he leaves them that the the writer of Matthew records. Now in verse 16, it talked about him telling the disciples to be there. He said, look, I'm going to get ready to leave and I need you to be there. And then in 17, people did show up and we'll, we'll talk about this more later. Some worshiped, but it said some doubted. And I would even say this, sometimes we worship and doubt at the same time. But then in verse 18, Jesus says to them, he he comes up to the mountain and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And behold, even I, I'll be with you to the very end of the age. That's what he's doing. Now, the reason I brought my backpack with me is this. This particular passage is is kind of a way to think through this is, is that this backpack in a way kind of represents all of Matthew 28. It's kind of a, it shows, hey, here's the, here's the passages. And in a very interesting way, what Jesus had been doing all throughout that kind of it's recorded in Matthew is he's been packing a bag for the guys. I remember there's a good friend of mine that goes here to Cornerstone, and one time she was trying to teach one of her kids a lesson about how life is supposed to be lived, and she takes a kid upstairs right in front of her and her husband's dresser, and she's got a a suitcase there, and she points at the dresser, and she says, that dresser right there represents your dad because he's going to be staying here. That suitcase represents you because you're going to be leaving And she said, I'm trying to pack that suitcase for you to prepare you because I know you're going to leave, which in today's realm, that means around 35 to 40. But you're going to eventually, you're going to, you're going to leave. Well, Jesus was packing a bag for them as well. And so off the front end, you know, you've got things like, like here's my climbing helmet uh, that I have that I never use it. It just looks cool. And I'm able to say that I've used it, but you've got a climbing helmet. You've got an ice axe that's a part of this. And so Jesus kind of put various things that are on there. And then at the very end, he's going to kind of tell us things that are kind of like important to us that we're going to talk about at the end. But at the core of it is this idea of make disciples. Now, last week when Christian talked, and we'll just let this bag represent go. All of you were surprised when he said, hey, I'm going to preach a sermon on go. And probably a lot of you went like, one word, but what you learned, like this stuff sack inside of one word, Matthew had loaded up that concept of go so that by the time Christians started to expand it for us and this understanding of not only we'd have our eyes out there and looking to where we're supposed to go globally, but we're also supposed to be looking right in front of us as we go, is that Matthew had packed that bag like that. Now, next week... Christian's going to come up, and we'll let this orange bag represent that. But he's going to talk about teaching. 
And one of the things that you're going to learn is just like this stuff sack is full of clothes and different things that you might need if you're going to go climb. He's going to, he's going to show you that that word teaching actually is very loaded. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to reach in and I'm going to grab this one, the red bag, which is going to represent baptizing. And one of the things that I can't wait to show you is that this one word is very loaded. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these out. Here's the first one. I've got these different ones in there. So we're going to put some key words out there. One of the words that we're going to need to understand about baptism is that, I, that word living. Now, all of you adults are going to join in now, but everybody's going to repeat it with me. Ready? The first word is living. Okay, what's the first word? Living. Okay, good, 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 good. The second word that we're going to look at is the word turning. So what's the first word? Living. What's the second word? Living. Okay, good. You parents are doing so good. I'm so proud of you. Now, the third word we're going to talk about that's in baptism is this idea of following. So the first word is? Second word is? The third word is? Hey, all of you kids that are next to parents, lean over and go, good job. Say, good job. Great, great job. All right. Okay, now I made up a word today. I love to make up words because that's what people from Wyoming do. When we can't think of a word, we just make up a word. If you don't believe me, like people from Texas are that way too. That's what George Bush did when he was president. He always made up words. So I'm going to make up a word, and the word is family-ing. All right? I, family is now a verb, and you add an ing to it, and then it's just going to describe it. So our first word is? Second word is? Third word is? Fourth word? Family. See, you learned a new word today. This is awesome. Now you know how hicks get along. We just, we just find a word and we just make it up. Now, last one. Here's our last word. is standing. So these are the five words. So let's go through them. The first word is? Three. Second word is? Three. Third word? Three. Fourth word? Family. Final one? Standing. Okay. You, <laughs> great job. You're participating so well. So let's start. Let's look at those a little bit while we're all together. This idea of living. And here's the key thing is that inside of this idea of baptism, and it might just be in its earliest form, but you know that your life is not your own, that you were saved to live for Jesus. Now, the question that we have to ask is, is how out of that word baptizing do we get this idea of the fact that I'm supposed to live for Jesus. Well, one of the things that took place back in Matthew 3, it's one of the stories told at the very, end, or the very beginning of Matthew that I believe Matthew put in for a strategic reason. He included this idea of baptism. So there he is. It says that John the Baptist is, is chilling. He's around the Jordan River at that particular time. He's in the wilderness of Judea, and he starts preaching the reality that this kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he calls them to do something. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. He calls them to repent. Now what took place is, is that everybody now starts to go out to this one who the prophet Isaiah said, he's going to be out there, so go out to him. He's the one that's going to be crying in the wilderness, prepare for the way for the Lord, make the paths straight. And what was crazy is, is people begin to go to him. Now, as they begin to go to him, it says in there, it tells us what John wore. Now, in an interesting way, I would highly encourage you, if anybody starts to sell camel's hair and for you to start eating, you know, uh, locusts and different things like that, don't do that. But the thing that he's trying to get at is, is this guy was coming from the wilderness. That's who he was. And people were going out to him. And look, at there's our word. They were, what's the word? baptized by him in the river Jordan and they were confessing their sins and we'll talk about confessing sins here in a little bit now that word baptism this is what I mean even if I could pull out another bag there's more to it and one of it is just what people kind of thought about it at the time now here's what a really smart guy said about it he said all the writers agreed that three things were required for the admission of and they called them proselytes they're just people that convert to Judaism 
is that there were people coming out and in kind of the same way that people that weren't part of the Jewish faith became part of the Jewish faith, that's what these people were doing. Now, in this particular context, what they would do is they would get circumcised, which that's the not fun part. The second part is, is they would get baptized. There's our word. And the third part is, is they would do a sacrifice. Women would just have to do the last two, which by the way, that that makes it unfair. (laughs) But the whole point was though, is around this baptism idea, is that these people would get baptized because that water represented something extremely important. You would go into the water as part of your racial or ethnic group. You would go in there in a sense and you would have a water burial, you would die, but you would come out of the water now and you would be a full blown Jewish person with all its rights and privileges and responsibilities. So in other words, you went in living for one thing and you came out to live for something new. Now here's the thing we have to understand about baptism. This is what Matthew's loading in. And this is something you can, if you're already a follower of Jesus, just to remind yourself, or maybe if you're thinking about baptism, you need to know this, or maybe you're just somebody that doesn't know Jesus, but the idea of baptism is, is when you go into that water, the person that you come out representative-wise is not the same person. You are no longer living for yourself, Paul talks about in Galatians like 2.20. You are no longer living for me, he also talks about in 1 Corinthians. Now you're living for Jesus. And you may not fully know what that means. It may not be completely comprehensible, but that's who we are. But let me just, let me put it to you this way. Why is it so important that we're living for him? Well, one of the things that Thomas talked about that's so important for us to get as followers of Jesus is what Jesus offers is far beyond anything we can even begin to imagine. We aren't just being offered like goodies or being offered things. We are being offered God himself. And in that, we we know from back in Matthew 13 that Jesus told a parable for this reason. He he told about this, this, this particular treasure in a field. He told about a pearl of great price. But what he realized was in the story, the thing he wanted people to realize, excuse me, was that they were to sell everything to go after it. Why? Because it is absolutely worth it. Now let me just personalize this for a second. I don't know how many of you remember being the first time you stood in the waters of baptism, but I very much do. I was standing in the waters in Bozeman, Montana. That's where I was. And as I'm in there, I remember just thinking to myself, first of all, this is amazing what I'm doing. But the one thought that came into my mind as I was standing there and they were kind of walking through everything as we got ready for baptism is that I couldn't wait for this because I knew Jesus is worth it. Jesus is absolutely worth it. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He says in Matthew 28, 18, he has all authority. And yet in all this authority, he is offering us himself and saying to us now, come no longer live for yourself, but I want you now to live for me. So the first t-shirt, that's what this represents, is this idea that I'm no longer gonna live for myself, but I'm gonna live for Jesus. So what's the first word? Living, good. Who wants a t-shirt? It says living. Oh! Oh, gosh. All right, that's the first word. Well, let's look at the second one of turning to Jesus. Well, not only are we to live for him, but all throughout Matthew, we start to learn this idea of this word Repentance. And even I heard Thomas come up and I heard different students and they use the word repentance and sometimes we don't know what that means. What repentance means is, is that I'm going one way and I need to go the other way. What Jesus was at in essence saying is, is you need to turn from something. In other words, you need to turn from the life, the dreams, the goals, the desires you had that at the end of it we're gonna learn are not worth it. You need to let go of those things and you need to turn to the one that we talked about, Jesus, who is absolutely worth it. We turn from one thing, but the important part is is that we turn to Jesus. Now, the interesting part about that is we're gonna learn about these guys all through the book of Matthew called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. who, Who are the Pharisees? 
Anybody know? Who are the Pharisees? Religious leaders kept the law, set up synagogues, right? And who are the Sadducees? What's that? They, they were more kind of political because they were sad, you see. <laughs> There's more jokes where that one came from. But these two groups of people come out to him. And Jesus says to them when they get out, look what he calls them there. You brood of what? You snakes. You brood of vipers, he says. Who warned you from the wrath to come? And then he says that word, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, he's saying to them, you don't really want to turn away from what you have and turn to me. And so therefore, this is all baloney what you're doing. He says, and don't presume to say to yourselves, you know, he talks about this idea of Abraham as their father, that they believed that because they were Jewish people, that somehow they were just going to be brought into this kingdom that Jesus was talking about. And he says to them, look, you don't understand something. If God wants to, he can grab stones and raise up his very own people. He then talks about this idea that, you know, that even now he says the, the ax is laid to this tree that's about to fall, this thing that they're a part of, and every tree that does not bear good fruit, he says, is, is cut down and thrown into the fire. In other words, what he's trying to help them to understand is everything that he gets to in verses 11 and 12, the things that they believed in were coming to an end. Now, let me just make sure those of you that, are, that aren't followers of Jesus understand this. The only life eternal that's ever offered is through Jesus Christ. There is no other life. He is the way, he's the true, he's the life that John talks about what Jesus said. All life, it doesn't matter if we're Jewish or we're Gentile or who we are, all of it is leading to the same end. Not only is it temporal, but the end of it is, Jesus says, it is cast into the fire. In other words, not just speaking about coming to an end, but the end is terrible. But all throughout the book of Matthew, instead, Jesus says, I want you to turn away from that, and I want you to turn to me. But all of you know this that have ever been baptized, when you were first standing in the water, do you fully understand what it meant to turn to Jesus? Kinda. But man, the longer that we walk with Jesus, the more we learn, I have so many things to let go of over here, but to embrace Jesus on this other end and turn to him. All right, so what's the first word in baptism? What? Good. What's the second word? Turning. Turning. Okay, who wants a shirt? Oh my gosh, why do the people in the back? <sighs> By the way, my Mets are in first place in the NL East. <sighs> All right, here we go. So that's the next one. Let's look at the next one, which is following Jesus. Now this one's a little bit more difficult to understand. In that same narrative in Matthew 3, along comes Jesus to be baptized by John. Now, let me just tell you something. John knew who he was. We find out in John 1, in another gospel that's written, that John points to Jesus and he goes, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In other words, John knows who this Jesus is. And suddenly Jesus shows up to John and he says, okay, now you need to baptize me. And John is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, can't, I can't baptize you. I'm not even worthy, he says in John, to tie your sandals. There is no way in the world you should be baptizing me. But here's the cool thing about Jesus. This is why we can live for him, and this is why we can turn to him, is that when Jesus Christ came to this world, he didn't just come as fully God. He came also as fully man, as one to follow. He entered fully into our world. And when John the Baptist, the prophet of that time, was calling people to be baptized because there's this new kingdom that's coming and he got baptized, he was saying to all of them in his baptism, I'm initiating a way. I'm set to become the pioneer for you to follow after me. In all of the Gospel of Matthew, he was showing them how to live. And he was even saying to them in Matthew 4, one of my favorite verses, he looks at the guys and he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, come watch me. I'm the pioneer. I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, on one level, we understand pioneers. Well, Christopher Columbus, he sailed the ocean blue when? 1492. They don't teach that anymore. I'm just kidding. 
Amerigo Vespucci, even Lewis and Clark. But the thing is, is nobody knew where to go till somebody went first. And Jesus was the first pioneer for people to follow. And in that particular moment, he was setting the stage. I will be the one to whom will initiate. I will enter into it. I will bear the reality of this world. I will show you how it's supposed to live. In other words, he wasn't God standing back. He was God entering into our world and even going so far as to death and being buried and rising again as the way for us now to have eternal life. And he was saying to them, follow me. So that's the third thing. Now, did I understand this completely? Not at all. I remember standing in the waters at the time. I was thinking, I still, seriously, I still remember this. It was cold. The water was cold. I remember that. I remember the guy saying a bunch of things, but let me tell you this. At that moment, I wanted to follow Jesus. All right, so what's the first word? Living. Living. What's the second word? Turning. Turning. And what's the third word? following. Okay, who wants a shirt? Oh my gosh, thank you for being up close. (laughs) And I still didn't make it. All right. All right. Let's look at this one, the word I made up. You're already raising your hand? I haven't even done my illustration yet. Man, your dad must be greedy. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Okay. Now, Family, where do we where do we get this one from? I'm going to talk to this side. I like you guys more, anyways. Now, familying. Now, this whole idea of familying with Jesus actually comes towards the end of the of the Matthew three story. Jesus gets, he gets baptized and it says immediately he went up from the water. That's kind of another one of the reasons you, people always ask, why do we baptize by immersion? There's just all these little clues throughout the Bible that seem to talk about this idea of immersion and it's kind of why, why we do it. There's more to it, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. But it says the, op- the heavens opened up and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove, it says, to rest on him. And behold, a voice that says from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, in this really cool way, it's the first time we ever see kind of the, the usness of God very clearly than the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus isn't just one of many gods He is one God who is now in this incredible way part of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, this journey that we've been called to, on one end, we're to now live for Jesus. In other words, we're to turn to Jesus. On another side now, we're to follow Jesus, but we don't follow Jesus alone. In fact, this whole concept is, and it comes to light, and you're going to see this then through the rest of the Bible, is we're part of a family with God as our father, Jesus now as our our brother, our, our older brother is kind of the idea that it puts there, and the spirit who causes unity, but we're a part of this thing that's a family. Now, let me just talk as a shepherd here with all of you here. I think this is a great Sunday to have all the kids here. Because in an interesting way, this is the little spiritual family that we're a part of. Now, there's no doubt different ones of you maybe have have not learned who Jesus is yet, and so you're not part of this family. But if you know who Jesus is, and you're a part of this particular local expression of God's family, we're family. We're not just kind of family. Actually, we are forever family. Jesus talks about it in like Matthew 12 where he's, this group of people come to him and they're like, Jesus, you wouldn't believe this. Your mother and your brothers are here. Now, if, if somebody showed up and said to me, hey, you know, Peggy and, and Josh and Gay Lynn are here, you need to go to them. I'd be like, first of all, my mom still scares me to this day. I would go to her. But Jesus says this statement, who are my, who's my mother and who are my brothers? He says, the ones who do the will of God, meaning We're a part of something different. We're a part of not only family, but a forever family, and not only any kind of a family. Look at this. We're a part of a family that stretches around the world. 
See, God from the very beginning didn't just want middle-class people from Simi to be a part of his kingdom. He wanted people from Africa and Asia and South America and Europe. He wanted, not really Australia, that was a penal colony, but he wanted people from, oh yes, he did, even one of them, all people to be a part of this amazing family. And we're supposed to live together like we actually believe it. And in fact, this is where in this particular part of the story, when we get baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, it's an acknowledgement of being baptized into the family. We're made a part of it through the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit with God as our Father. So what's the first one? Living. What's the second one? Turning. Turning. What's the third one? And you guys don't get to answer. What's the fourth one? Family, okay. I don't know if I can throw it that far. Ah. Ah! Oh. All right. I know where JT lives. I'll go steal it and I'll give it to somebody more deserving. All right, here's the last one, okay? The last one is this idea of standing with Jesus. That when we are now within those waters of baptism, we may only understand it partially, but this idea of standing with Jesus is very, very important. Now it comes from this idea out of verse 20 when it says, behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now in this, I want you to make sure that you understand all of you in here, do you know who your father is if you're a follower of Jesus? Your father is the one who spun all of the universe into existence. And the more that we get different telescopes, how amazing is the universe that we live in? Jesus Christ, your your true older brother, the one who's going to receive all rights and authorities, and then also because of him, we have him. He's the one, it talks about in Colossians 1, who everything was created by and everything was created for. And it says in there that the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, meaning our God is a God who is unstoppable. And because now we are included into him because of the work of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit, by the choosing of our amazing Father, we now are a group of people that Romans talks about. If God is for us, who can be what? Against us. I want all of you kids in here to understand this because us adults forget this a lot. There is no ruler in the world. There is no group of people. There is no situation over which our God is not big enough. He is bigger than anything going on in the world. I know us moms and dads around election time, we get a little nervous. So coming up here in November, everybody's going to be like, oh, we're nervous. What's going to happen to the world in which we live in? Let me just tell you kids this. Jesus is still going to be on his throne reigning and ruling over all things. The Father is still going to be orchestrating all things and moving them towards a wonderful end. And the Spirit of God, for those that follow Jesus, will never leave you at all. Therefore, no matter the circumstance or the situation, you can stand. And we're called to stand with Jesus. Now let me finish with a story about standing. One time I was up in the mountains and I was fly fishing. It's a form of fishing and I'd cut a bunch of fish and my friends had caught a bunch of fish and I went kind of around and I grabbed all the fish and we do what's called cleaning them so that we can cook them and eat them and it was gonna be awesome. And I'm over there with my little knife and all of a sudden I see that the trees start to go back and forth. And as the trees went back and forth, I'm thinking to myself, something is coming through the trees. And all of a sudden, a big old sow grizzly bear comes through there and she stands up and I've got a knife and fish. I didn't even have a sling, some stones, I had nothing. And I stood, not because I was confident, I stood because in what's called fight, flight, or freeze, I found out that when I get stared, I freeze, I stand. (laughs) Now what was incredible though, there was me, I was standing, but my buddy had a big gun. And he came and he didn't shoot the bear. He just went boom, 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 and kind of a little bit louder than that. And that grizzly bear ran away. 
he stood because he had a big gun. Now, let me just tell you this. Jesus is bigger than any old gun. He's bigger than anything that there is in the world. And so, therefore, you can stand with Jesus. So what's the first one? Living. Living. What's the second one? Turning. Turning. What's the third one? Following. Following. What's the third one? Fourth one? (laughs) Family. What's the... (laughs) Whose children are these? (laughs) Oh, wait, it's my son. No, everybody's, what's the fifth one first? Standing. Standing. Now, I'll I'll throw this in a bit. Hold on, everybody sit down. All of those things come together, and we may not fully understand them, but we are to be something that when we stand in that water, that's where we're looking. We're looking to be people that look in that direction. Now, there's more to baptism, which we'll talk about another time. But I think what's so cool about it is that's what Jesus wanted people to understand. He wanted us to get that this baptism thing is amazing. Now, let me, let me, let me finish this way. When we talk about the idea of baptism, we're going to talk more about this idea of, of, the, of, of the definition of a disciple, which Christian brought up way back in the fall that we'll talk more about this idea of learning from Jesus, trusting in Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and helping others to do the same. This baptism thing is the initiation of that. It's what begins to send us in that direction. It does not save us, but it does initiate us to move in a direction. If you've never been baptized before, let me just say this. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus and haven't been baptized, that makes zero sense. In fact, It either means you're really not a follower of Jesus or you don't care that you're in disobedience to God. It does not save you, but why in the world would you be in disobedience to God? So, if you haven't been baptized and you've now seen what we've talked about and you'd like to get baptized, we would really love to talk to you about getting baptized and we can even do it next week, the week after, whatever. We'll make sure that the tank is full and we can baptize. I don't care if you're someone that's a little kid or someone that is, that is older than me. Everything in between, we want to make sure you know that the baptism, the waters are always open to people. But here's the last thing. Let me, let me talk to, to those of you that are followers of Jesus. Every time somebody gets baptized, I hope those five words flash into your head. I hope you remember. One of the things that I always do whenever I do a wedding and I'm standing there, you know, the dearly beloved, we are gathered here, you know, and I walk through all the things with the couple. I always love in the middle of it to look out and remind myself, it's not just their words. I'm looking out also at my wife going, do you remember when 75 years ago we got married? (laughs) And she looked great for that many years of marriage. But remember, remember, We're a part of, and Christian reiterated this last week, and I want to say it this week. When you stand in those waters, it's an understanding you are a part of the greatest one ever. You're a part of the greatest mission ever. And those of us in this room right now, that followers of Jesus, never forget who we are. And all God's people said? Okay, who's over here? I haven't got to them yet. Okay. (sighs) Look, how old are you? The two of you. All right. Now, if you can't stand up, I'd like to pray for us. And uh, then the band is going gonna, is gonna to close things off. Can you get that? Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for everybody that's here. Thank you for who they are, who you've created them to be. Father, I pray for Cornerstone. Would you help us to be a church that truly does live for Jesus because he is is worthy. He is worth it. Father, would you help us to be a group of people that not just one time turned away from our sin and to Jesus, but would you teach us to be a group of people that in an ongoing way learns how to turn from our sin and turn to Jesus on a regular basis? Father, would you teach us to be people that that learn how to follow you in greater and greater ways that 
That Father, Father, I love the fact that you have a whole life, a journey in which you're teaching us what it means to follow you. But I am so thankful that you sent your son in a powerful way to show us how we're intended to live. And may we be a church that above all things makes our example Jesus Christ. I beg you. Father, teach us what it means to be a family where we truly do have a father, the great good father. Teach us what it means that, that we have the, a brother who's the firstborn among many brethren. Teach us the reality of what it means now through the power of your Holy Spirit that we have been now sealed in for the promise, the inheritance that our family has. And Father, also would you, would you teach us to be a group of people that stands firm regardless of what's going on in this world? Father, help us to be people not to lose our heads in the midst of all the turmoil that's going on around us, but Father, instead, help us to keep our feet planted in Jesus Christ. Help us to be people that are immovable, not because of us, but because of the great God in whom we serve. And so, Father, do your powerful work in the life of our church, not just in baptism, but Father, I can't wait to hear next week as you teach us what it means to follow your son, Jesus Christ. In your precious name we pray, amen. We're gonna sing this last song. Let me say this to you. Our Father, our Father is the omnipotent ruler of this universe. But as our dad, he is personal. King Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. But he died for us because he loves us. The Spirit of God moves in ways we will never understand accomplishing things that are powerful. But He's in us that are followers of Jesus. So in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, may those of you who are baptized leave here as not just anybody, but you are kids of the King. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.